Well, hello, everyone. This is Digging Deeper. Yeah, we, we are digging. I really mean we're digging into that book of Ephesians. Well, I'm Pastor D, and I'm from the Heights Church. Again, this is Digging Deeper, and we're in the book of Ephesians. We're in chapter 2. Are you ready for that? I know that you might say, boy, a lot of this is sounding the same. Well, you know what? Paul repeats himself. Isn't that great for us adults who sometimes let things go in one ear and out the other? Well, anyway, we need to get into today's lesson. I heard this quote from Edmund Burke. And you say, who in the world is that? Edmund Burke was a philosopher and a statesman. He was also an economist. And this is what he said. Whatever disunites a man from God also disunites man from man. Did you get that? If we are united with God, we aren't going to be united with our fellow brothers and sisters. We're not going to be united with other believers. Something to make you pause. In Psalm 133, verse 1 in the ESV, it says this, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers fall, or hey, we don't want to fall, but him who thinks he stands, he might fall, but we're not falling. Let me go back over that. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers, and that means all God's people, dwell together or live together or just dwell in unity. God is all about unity. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit aren't up in heaven bickering. They aren't struggling over situations. They aren't comparing themselves against themselves. They are united. So what's in Ephesians chapter 2? Well, Ephesians chapter 2 is talking about unity in the body. And there's a definition that I want to share of unity. It means being joined together, you know, together or in agreement. So Paul in chapter 2 asks us, the body of Christ, the believers, to reflect. We need to reflect on the fact that we were once dead in our sin and trespasses. I mean, we were dead. We were dead. D-E-A-D, dead. But now, because of Jesus, we're reconciled to God. We're restored in our friendship with God. We get grace and love because of Jesus Christ. The next thing Paul talks about is being one church, one church in Christ. I was listening this week at a Sunday sermon that a guest pastor was teaching at our church, Pastor Craig Langham's, and he said this, we are not the same, but we are one. We should gather around the things we believe in, not the things we differ in. Can I get a thumbs up on that one? We, we don't need to worry about some stuff. If we are in Christ, we should be united. No, we look different. We sound different. Some of us are tall. Some of us are thin. Some of us are fat. Some, you know, we all look different. Even our color is different but we are one in Christ. And so we need to gather around what we do believe in that is Jesus. The church is the body of Christ. And this includes all believers, all those who believe in Jesus Christ. Now, there are a lot of gods out there, little G gods, but we're talking about the one true God, the living God, the Alpha and Omega, his son. Do we believe in him? Did we accept him? Are we living for him? Colossians 1, 17 to 18a in the ESV, and all my scripture is going to be coming from the ESV. It says there, and he is, be and who is this he? It's Jesus. And he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body the church. He is our head. And you know what? The body shouldn't be running off 
and disentangling himself from the head. Wouldn't that look strange if I had gotten up here without a head? We need to stay connected to the head. So we need to listen to the head too, and I'm going to get into that more. So what's so special about the book of Ephesians? We started last week with Ephesians 1. Well, what's so special about this? Why do we want to get into this book? I'm telling you, this is an outstanding piece of work that Paul did here. And it's for us believers. If you don't read anything else and study it hard, study Romans and study Ephesians. That is for the church. We need to get in there, I'm telling you, because we will learn some things and we will be strengthened by some things and we will be more like Jesus because that's what we're trying to do here. So what's so special? Paul was in this book administering a discipline needed to further develop the believers into true children of God. Well, can there be false? Well, if they, they're true children of God, there could be people that are purporting to be children of God that are not. This book, Ephesians, will help fortify and establish us. Paul wants us, just as he did the Ephesians believers, to fulfill the purposes and the call of God. And then finally, Paul shows us our value in God's overall design. We are being built into a dwelling place for the great God. Yeah, by, by the Spirit, we are being built into that dwelling place. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God dwells in us. We want to be the kind of temples that God talks about in his book. And I'm not going to get into that. You need to go read that in 1 Corinthians 6. We are going to be in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 21, again, in the ESV. So let's get right into them. I know it's a lot of verses, but you know what? You can't always encapsulate something down to two verses. We need to hear what the Spirit is saying to us, the church, through these verses. But now in Christ Jesus, let me repeat that, now in Christ Jesus, I don't want to mess up Jesus' name, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And I'll be talking more about that. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace, did you hear that? So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. Boy, that's something to be excited about. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a temple, a holy temple, in the Lord. Aren't you glad of that? It's a lot. There's a lot in there. And we're going to talk more about some of those things. I want to go back to verse 13 because there Paul is talking about our relationship being restored. We were once enemies of God. We were in enmity with God. We were afar off. We were in his displeasure but we were cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is what brought us back. And we have full access, full access. We can come boldly to the throne. Blood was spilt. A sacrifice was made for our behalf. Yeah, Jesus was willing to shed his blood for us. 
It is hard to take in. Not anyone that I can think of would have shed their blood for me. So I am very grateful that he made that sacrifice. But he didn't make it only for me. I don't want you to think he did. He made it for you also. God always meant to include the Gentiles. That's us. We're the included ones because his original family were the Jews. But now he's brought us in. We're adopted. So he always meant to bring the Gentiles in in his overall plan of salvation. Listen to what Isaiah 57, verse 57:19b through 21. It says there in Isaiah, peace, peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says God. There is no peace for the wicked. There's peace for us. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, yeah, I'm digging that. We have a restored relationship. Now God is my father. I can even call him daddy or Abba. That's how close we are. That's how close you are. You can go right to him. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. Jesus did everything that needed to be done. It's settled now. Let's look a little bit at verse 15. In verse 15, God has declared peace because we just spoke about peace. In Paul's time, the dividing walls between the Jews and the Gentiles were torn down. Christ annulled and replaced the old system of religion, ushering in a new and living way. This included all divisions between believers all divisions, and I'm not talking about cults like Mormonism or Jehovah. Will. I am saying the barriers that we sometimes have in this day and age, which we call denominationalism, where we look at someone, you know, from another denomination and we think, or if they're even in a denomination, we think something's wrong with them. No, they believe in Christ. As long as they believe in those fundamental things, that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he died on a cross and that he rose after the third day and that now he's seated at the right hand of God and he ever liveth to make intercession. If we need to gather around those things, remember I said, Pastor Craig said to gather around the things that are pertinent, that are important. Not always looking at the things that we may, may have a little theological difference on. Let's focus on what's important and that's always always Jesus. We are one body through the cross. And hopefully, because we're one body, we're of one mind and heart. God's way is peace. And our only enemy is Satan, not people, especially not our Christian brothers and sisters. Listen to Ephesians 2, 16. Okay, we're staying in that second chapter of Ephesians, verse 16 and 17, that he might reconcile, and he again is Jesus, that he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are afar off and peace to those who were near. Pastor D, you just said that. Well, you know what? It needed to be repeated. We need to be at peace with each other, brothers and sisters. I hate it when I see people come into church and start ducking other people because they don't want to be around them. That's not the way we treat our brothers and sisters. Or they go by them. They act like they don't exist. I've even seen, I've even had, I've said hello to people in the body of Christ and they haven't even responded. They acted like I was a piece of wallpaper. That's not what Christ wants. We're one body. We should love one another as he has loved us. And we need to be at peace. And so anybody out there who has a problem with me, because sometimes I'm teaching things and people say, oh, Pastor D is so hard on stuff. If you have a disagreement with me, come and see me. Sit down with me. Tell me what you disagree with me about. Don't just get an attitude and go off half cocked. 
Well, let me get on off of that because we need to carry on with what we're studying, and that's Ephesians 2. Listen to this quote from John Wolford. He was an author and actually a former president of Dallas Theological Seminary. He said, the only way it is possible to have one mind is to have the mind of God derived from the unity of the spirit of God, a unity which comes only when believers find the will of God and give themselves unselfishly and unstintingly, meaning generously, to its fulfillment. We can only do the things that I'm talking about, that unity, that love, that peace, that harmony with other believers. We can only get that through Jesus. So maybe I need to break down a little more why Christian unity is so important. Well, Jesus prayed for it. Jesus wants that for us. In John 17, 11, Jesus said, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. He wants us to be one as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. Boy, I just want to resound that. We need to be one. Hallelujah. Come on, people of God. We need to keep pressing forward, pressing toward that mark. He wants us to have that unity so that the world will know Jesus. If we're always in fighting, people are not going to want to know Jesus. They are not going to see Jesus in us. Jesus was sent from God, and he loves us. He loves us. That's why he did what he did. Our unity, our closeness, our being of one mind, our solidarity glorifies God. Yeah, our unity. He loves that. It exemplifies him. So we're representing well then. And then finally, unity is a signal of our maturity. Uh-oh. <laughs> Maybe we're not unified. Maybe we don't like our brothers and sisters because we are totally immature. All right, I'm going to shut that down. Maturity is derived from a relationship with the Holy Spirit. See, we, I, again, I just have to say, we can't do the kind of things that Jesus wants us to do unless we plug in, plug into him, plug into his word, plug into the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit lead our lives. Let the Holy Spirit be chief in our lives, not our head or our heart lead us. Our heart will make us emotional. Our head intellectualizing. No, that's not it. It is Holy Spirit all the way. Let's follow him. Because those that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Well, I'm closing. Believe it or not, I'm done. Yeah. You're going to have to go back and listen to it again if you miss something. I saw this in the Africa Study Bible. And it was by Samuel Ngewe. He said this, those who belong to the church have been placed on earth for a mission. Jesus referred to this mission using the terms light and salt. Just as salt preserves food from rotting, so believers are called upon to stop the world's moral decay. Just as light helps us see our path, so also believers are called to point all people to the true light who changes lives. Creating love where there is hatred, reconciliation where there is hostility, and hope when there's desperation. This is what the church united is called to do through Christ Jesus. 
Well, I am hoping that God has laid something on your heart through our conversation here. And no, I can't hear what you're saying, but I still feel like it's a conversation. I can't force you to listen, but I hope you will listen because this is God's word. And it's for us. It's for all of us. For me, you say, well, you're a pastor. No, that doesn't mean I get it all the time. I have to work at it. I have to correct myself. I have to see if I'm, I make adjustments because I have to see if I'm doing the things that God wants me to do. We need to be united. And so when you step into church this Sunday or when you meet the saints somewhere, I hope that you are united with them and you're not ducking away from them or ignoring them and acting like they don't exist. Well, I love you. I hope to see you next week. And we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3. Will you pray with me? Come on, let's pray. Father, thank you for the word that you gave us here in Ephesians 2. Lord, we want to be unified. We want to be um, in unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us. Show us if there are things that we are avoiding or things we're overlooking or things we aren't doing that we should be doing. Help us to do them by your spirit. We give you all the thanks and praise for what you've already done in our lives. We thank you, Jesus, that you tore down those walls that divided us from God. Thank you that we're no longer an enemy of God because of your sacrifice. Holy Spirit, continue to walk with each and every person at the sound of my voice. And Lord Jesus, I want to listen to the Spirit. We give you thanks today. God, for this word, in Jesus' name, amen.